All right, everyone, hello. Thank you so much for joining me. My name is Jason Levine, Principal Worldwide Evangelist for Creative Cloud, focusing on audio and video. And for those of you tuning in on Facebook, thank you so much for joining us live. Uh, we are here at IBC day one, and for the next 20 minutes or so, going to be talking about some of the new features we are bringing to the next version of Premiere Pro CC. If you caught any of our live stream last night on the Creative Cloud Facebook page, um, you'll be able to see, again, a little bit more of what you saw there last night. So here we are in Premiere, and the first couple things I'm going to talk to you about are features that were direct user requests, things that we got from the forum, different places where we get user feedback to really um, improve and sort of maximize your time in the applications. In fact, one theme across all of these new updates is simply time, giving you back time to be more creative so that you're not wasting time doing a lot of common things. And one of those things is removing gaps. So here we have a scene from uh, this show called Make It, for which I am also a host. These are my colleagues, Paul and Brooke. And as we are assembling the edit, you can see down below here that we've left some gaps where we might insert you know, some B-roll or cut to something else. Or oftentimes, when I'm assembling an edit, I'll just kind of leave a gap. These are actually ready to be sort of snapped together. Um, but I'm just kind of spacing things around and moving content around. So previously, if I wanted to simply close all those gaps, there was no real easy way to do that. There wasn't like a single function that could close all the gaps. There were ways to kind of make it happen with different keyboard shortcuts, but ultimately we didn't have a function that could do this. And you really wanted this. I was even interviewing one of our influencers recently on one of our other live streams. First thing she asked me was, how do I close all the gaps? My answer was, wait. So now, under the sequence menu, you will see that we have a new feature, close gap. Now, with nothing selected, if you choose Close Gap, it does all that. Everything just snaps together quite brilliantly. Now, again, you might have sections that you want snap together to close the gap. So if I make a selection and do the same thing here, and by the way, you'll see this does not currently have a keyboard shortcut assigned. You can use our visual keyboard shortcut editor to assign a keyboard shortcut to that. I just don't have one on this machine. Close the gap for the selection. Very simple, all right? Saving time. Right? giving you back time, not wasting your time. Now, you might have noticed as you're looking at these sequences here that things look very, very colorful. Did you notice that? You notice there seems to be more color inside the timeline? That's because we've heard for many years now, we need more color labels. We've given you eight. You've had eight color label choices for a very long time. Very happy to announce that now, when you go into preferences labels, we give you 16. <laughs> They're all fully editable, fully customizable. You can set whatever of the labels that you want as your defaults. And again, if you want to modify the colors, I actually have heard users say before, ah, I wish I could just kind of change. You've got some really strange colors in here. You just click there, now you've got your traditional color picker, and you can modify it to whatever you want. All right? So again, more color labels. Not only does it just make the UI look even nicer, but it's really, for organization, a fantastic time saver. And now, again, you can access all of these, just as before, via the right-click menu as well. All right. OK. Now, again, when I'm working uh, in Premiere, doing a lot of live streams, oftentimes I'm navigating between different projects. And like many of you, I'm sure you experience a similar thing where I'm constantly sort of moving panels around, placing this panel up here, redocking these things, uh, putting things into view when I need them. And if you want to go back and kind of reset your workspace to the way it was, in today's version, you have to go up to Window, Workspaces, Reset to Save Layout. And when you do that, then it gives you a prompt. And then you click OK, and then it resets the workspace. But we have the workspace bar at the top. Wouldn't it be nice if I could simply just double click the workspaces that are viewed here, and it resets it automatically? So now, coming in the next version, if you double click here, now again, I can turn off this confirmation. I have it set to always ask. I'm leaving that on for demo purposes. But I can say, yep, I want to discard the changes and continue. And it takes me back to the default state. Five clicks the other way. Now just a single double click, done. Time, giving you back time, right? Be more creative with that time. OK. So in the spirit of user requests, this next feature deals directly with that. 
I'm going to go up to the file menu here, and I'm going to start opening up additional projects. This new feature is called, curiously, multiple open projects. Something that people have been asking for for a very long time. So now you have the ability to open multiple projects and edit between projects simultaneously. And this is really ideal for a single editor looking at a linear progression of scene or episodes, or really just any other way to kind of break down things into uh, smaller entities. And what you can see I'm doing here, I'm just docking the different projects side by side. And this is, again, these are all from the Make It Show. We've been cutting together a little teaser trailer here. So I'm going to be borrowing bits and pieces uh, from different episodes to build up the teaser. You'll notice down in the window menu here, you'll now see a projects reference, and it shows you that all three of these projects, with all of their content, are now open and accessible and editable. And again, you can work across all of these simultaneously. So again, here's the little teaser that we have. I'll play a couple seconds of this for you. Okay. <laughs> By the way, what is going on here? Okay. So you can see we've got this little section right there where I want to drop in some content, okay? Now the content that I want happens to be in uh, episode four with my colleagues Paul and Brooke. So I'm going to go into their footage here. I grab this clip, take a little piece of this clip right here, simply drag this down into my teaser timeline, snap it to the edge, Wind it back. All right, and we're done. Multiple projects being open. And when I go into the teaser project, what you'll actually see is it's now added the footage that I just dragged in to this project. But it didn't actually add the physical footage, just a reference. So that's key. It didn't copy over. This is, this is I think this is all red media. I didn't copy over an R3D file now inflating that project. It's just a reference to the original media wherever it lived. So one of the other benefits with multiple open projects is that it allows you to really work more efficiently. So in the case of something like this where you have multiple episodes, but we're cutting everything together into kind of a master teaser project, well, because you can separate things out even by scene, each of those projects will be smaller which means faster to save, faster to auto-save, faster to load and conform, right? You don't have to keep everything. You know, if you've got a, a long-form edit with 10,000 pieces of media and it's 30 scenes, that takes some time to open. We hear this all the time. Oh, I'm opening this project. It has 10,000 files. It took an hour to conform everything. Yeah, probably. <laughs> but with now multiple open projects, you can have each scene broken down, and you can have all of these different things open and live and editable and drag media across them very efficiently. And again, just to kind of showcase that to you, you know, if I were to undock this and even drag in something like a, you know, a sequence into one of these, it's just bringing over the reference and then any associated media with that as references. Okay? Really simple, really easy. Now, uh, one of the things that we also wanted to give you was not only the ability to open multiple projects, but what about work collaboratively? Now, we have team projects, and we're also announcing at the show that team projects in this next update will officially be a 1.0. That is sort of cross-continental collaboration. You can be anywhere in the world using network-based storage, someone in Germany, someone in the US, someone in Australia. <clears throat> You've got a database that's kind of wrangling all this together. You've got asset conflict management. You've got all these other things. Very complex, very detailed. That's for Creative Cloud teams and enterprise. But for the individual user, we wanted to give you something that's just a bit more lean, a bit more flexible, and a bit more local. So in this next version, we're introducing something called Shared Projects. And Shared Projects basically offers a productive workflow for organizing productions when working on a single local network. So if we go into our preferences here under Collaboration, you'll see that we now have something called Enable Project Locking. So simply by enabling this, 
And for each user that's logged in, they denote a name for themselves. This could be, again, I call this Edit Bay IBC, you know, I call this Edit Bay 1, okay? Click OK on this. All right. And what this is going to allow us to do now, you'll notice down at the bottom of the project panel, we have this little lock icon here. This project is writable. Go ahead and click on that. All right. Why is this not doing it? Oh, here, let me try this one. Sorry. Well, I'm going to close this project and reopen it. All right, here we go. Let's go ahead and lock this. All right, now it shows as locked. This project is read only. Now, if someone else were trying to access this, and let me make sure I've got this open here. Let's say they start trying to move footage around. Pick this up and drag it over here. It doesn't let me do it. You see that? It's just snapping back into place. Nothing's happening because it's been read only. So you can imagine where you've got assistants and craft editors sort of managing content. This is very cool because one person could be bringing in content into one sequence. Someone could be bringing in stuff from another. And when I'm done doing my assembly to hand off to the person who's going to do all the titling, I unlock it and now they can use it. And when they're done, they can unlock it and allow me to do something else. So it's just a fast, efficient way to share projects, again, via local storage. We mentioned like assistants and craft editors collaborating together in a local environment and really access the same content very, very quickly and efficiently and still have that same multiple open project concept as well, right? So you can have multiple versions of this. We even allow you from within side of your projects to create an additional shared project. So we'll call this uh, dailies, okay? And just as with before, you know, I can take some of the work we've been doing here and drag that into dailies, and it imports that media, again, non-destructively, very easily, okay? So that's shared projects. All right. So let's see. Okay, we've got about 14 minutes. So let's switch projects here and talk about some changes and revisions that we've made to Premiere's essential graphics panel Sorry, I got some hair in my mouth there. Essential, <coughs> essential graphics panel and motion graphics templates. So this is a feature that we introduced in April, basically redesigning and reimagining the traditional Premiere Pro titler. It's going to allow you to do titles, lower thirds, captions. We've got a whole series of different presets for you. But we wanted to take it even a step further this time around. And one of the ways that we wanted to do that was by allowing you to create templates that are responsive. Responsive to time and responsive to position. Now, a lot of us know the term responsive from web design, right? So as you reflow, readjust the size of a web page, if it's a responsive-based site, all of the content on that page reflows accordingly, right? You know you're on an old site where if you resize the window and it's like a classic two or three column and nothing shifts or moves around, it doesn't look good, it doesn't look good on your phone, not responsive, right? Well, today, in the existing version that you have, if you create, say, a lower third, right, for a 16.9 video, and then you're going to repurpose that video, as many of us do, for Instagram. You're going to do a little quick Instagram burst, and you're going to do square. Well, if you take that same template that you built for 16.9 and throw it on your square content, it's not going to look right. You're going to have to rescale it. You're going to have to resize it, probably move it a little bit. And similarly, if you take that same thing again, and now we repurpose it for an Instagram story or Snapchat vertically, you take that template, you drag it in, same thing. It's not going to look right. So we wanted to fix all of that. The other thing we wanted to solve is if you create animations inside of a template, let's say I'm using something for a title sequence. Well, I might want the animation to always be a particular duration. So even if you drag out that template to be longer, the animations there should be some way to lock down how the animations occur so that they're always the same. Responsive time. So we've added this feature as well. So the first example here deals with this concept of responsive time. We've got some text flying in. You know, let me see if I can go to full on this. Text flies in and then animates out. All right. 
So I'm going to select this, and you'll see when I select this motion graphics template, we now have responsive design time. And I can set that intro duration. So I always want that animation to exist within one second and 10 frames, and then the outro animation to be 20 frames. When I go into my effects controls, what you actually see in the panel here, this gray area represents those durations that you set over here in the Essential Graphics panel. And any keyframes that exist in those gray regions will always be that same duration. All right, now you can actually see I missed a couple of these keyframes here. They're outside. So I'm just going to drag them inside of that safe zone. It also is reflected on the actual clip itself. Now, any animation that you might have in the middle, let's say you have something random that flies on screen or some more text or graphic or a logo or whatever, that stuff, as you stretch or contract that graphic, will stretch and squeeze accordingly. But anything that's within those set durations for in and out will never change. So, case in point, if I were to drag this out, now think about how this works today, right? If you make something longer, those keyframes are now in different places, right? It doesn't work that way today. In this next version that we drag it out, all that animation still exists in the same exact duration. One second, 10 frames there. Again, nothing's happening here. It lingers, and then 20 frames out. But if I shrink this way down, again, the animation itself doesn't change. The stuff in the middle, again, would be squeezed now. But the actual animation as we created it is preserved perfectly. Responsive design time, OK? Now, just because I mentioned it, let's hop over to that one. This one is one of my favorites, because this is something which, if you're not doing this right now, this is something you will likely be doing shortly thereafter, um, creating content that is responsive to position or aspect ratio. So here, I've got just a little title that I'm flying up. And I'm actually going to use our responsive design position pinning. So I'm going to pin this to the video frame. And just very briefly, I'm going to turn on my safe margins. And I'm going to move this text over so that it's just sitting on our action safe margin here. I'm going to pin this text layer to the video frame, specifically to the bottom right corner. Can you see that up there? So here's where you have, uh, here's where you have responsive design position. And I told it, always pin it <clears throat> to the bottom right corner. And I, I turned on those margins so that you can see where it's going. So what I'm going to do is I'm now going to save this as a template. And we'll call this VHIBC2 pin right. All right? Click OK on that. Oh, where did I just save that, by the way? Hold on, I didn't, let me, let me see where I saved it. Did I save it to my library? I did, OK. So in my libraries, these are my Creative Cloud libraries. You can see this right here, just created. Six seconds, nine kilobytes, VH, IBC2, pin right. So now, when I go to the square version of this same video that I'm repurposing for Instagram, when I take that graphic that we just made, the text appears in the exact same position, okay? as you would hope it would. Similarly, let's go ahead and change this from square to vertical. Drag in our graphic, play it back, same position, OK? Such a timely, useful, cool addition. Because what this does is this now gives you future compatibility for your templates, right? If you design them regardless of what frame size, aspect ratio you design in, being responsive, they will conform to whatever the next flavor is, all right? I don't know where else we can go, vertical, 16.9, or square, but I'm sure there's something. I can't even think of a term right now. It'll come to me later. All right. So a little bit of uh, responsive design there. 
And by the way, I'm just going to play this back because we've only got five more minutes. Just to kind of show you, not in terms of complexity, but in actual simplicity, how this works. So here we have a little graphic of the universe. And I like showing this because, so basically, what's going on here is we've, first and foremost, we've got the sun with some rotation keyframes, all right? So the sun is rotating. And it's pinned to the video frame, all right, in the center. And then we've got Venus, which is also pinned to the video frame, rotating around the sun. And then we've got the Earth, which is pinned to the sun, to the upper left corner of the sun, also rotating. And you can see the set, we set the rotation here. And then we've got the moon, which is pinned to the Earth graphic, to the upper left, rotating around the Earth, OK? So this kind of just gives you an idea of how you can set up these pinning relationships really quickly and easily, um, and again, responsively, so that this always works, OK? Taking that one step further, another user request that came up, something that we didn't have in the initial launch of Essential Graphics was the credit roll. So we've now brought that back. We can enable the credit roll. You can see you've got all the same options here that you had in the, in the traditional title. There's start, off screen, end off screen, pre and post roll, ease in and out. You've got a little scroll bar here to let you see all of your text. By the way, you can type this text as individual layers as we did here. Um, inside Essential Graphics, or you can copy text layers from Photoshop, Illustrator, After Effects, and paste them into the Essential Graphics panel. The font and some or most of your layer styles will carry over. <laughs> there are some elements from Photoshop that won't. Um, but primarily, your font and basic styles should. Okay? So just to kind of show you here, again, nice little credit roll. and. As you'd expect, this too is responsive. So if you want this to be longer, right, you drag it out, it adjusts its speed. It just goes that much more slowly and adjusts speed accordingly. It'll still start off screen and end off screen. Right? If we shrink it up, we do the opposite, right? same thing. <clears throat> drag this in. Drag this in. It just happens that much faster, OK? So completely responsive, credit roll, responsive design time, responsive design position. All right. And some really beautiful footage. I love this footage that we're using this year. OK. All right, and the very last thing I'm going to show you here in three minutes is related to some of the changes, additions, and innovations that we're bringing to this next version of Premiere Pro with regard to immersive video. Many of you may have heard that uh, just, just a few months back, we acquired a bunch of the Metal Skybox plugins, which will be directly integrated into Premiere Pro. So if you're working in 360 VR, a lot of things were sort of missing. People kept asking, like, how do I do text projection? My answer to them was, you have to get Metal Skybox. OK, what if I want to change the orientation, like the starting point of my 360? That's a great idea. You have to go to Metal Skybox. Or what if I want to add some 360 designed transitions and effects? These are not the same transitions that we use in standard 2D or equilinear content. My answer was, you have to go to Metal Skybox. Well, now you will have this directly integrated into Premiere Pro and After Effects. So you truly have a complete suite of VR 360 authoring tools right at your fingertips. So where you'll find these things is under Effects, and they're all rebranded Immersive. So let's start with some text. So I'm going to go ahead. I created a little text template here called Venice in the Summertime. All right, and this is just standard flat 2D text. Now, if I were to go into the VR viewer, today this is what you see, and this is not correct. <laughs> it should not bend and skew like that. That's because this is not a 360. It doesn't know what to do. It doesn't know how to project this 2D thing in a 360 environment. You need, you need an effect to handle that. You need what Metal is now calling the VR plane to sphere. 
So we're going to go ahead and add VR plane to sphere to this. Let's go into our effects controls. And the first thing I'll do is going to scale it up. This kind of acts like your Z depth. But what's unbelievably cool about this is that now we can also reorient where this needs to be. So let's actually say that I want that text to be oriented along the side wall. Well, now I can twirl down, rotate projection, and I'm going to adjust the projection pan on the y-axis. And I can have this automatically, perfectly conform in the correct aspect, just like that. So now as we play this back, oh, look, we've got some properly projected 360 text. You can still move all the way around, but it's just in the right position now, all right? <laughs> And of course, you can animate and do all the other things that you'd want to do with this very easily. But this begs the question now. Again, popular request was, OK, how do we change that start point? Right? You filmed your 360 looking this way, but I actually want the user to start looking over here. We did not have a way to do that before. In this next version, you will have that function. It's called VR Rotate Sphere. Go ahead and drag this down onto our Venice content. And I'm going to turn on our controls, because I want you to see we are at zero. Your zero point is your starting point, your orientation point. So we're not moving it in the viewer. We're actually realigning where the start point is. Let's go ahead and use our y-axis here. We want to start it over there. And there it is. And you can see that is now we've just reconfigured our start point here. All right? So cool. You asked, you got it, right? It's only been a few months. So, so cool that we now have this directly integrated. Last thing I'll show you here is related to some of the cool transitions that we have. Uh, here's one VR light rays. If you watch a lot of content on YouTube, you've probably seen a lot of these transitions. That's because most of them came from metal. <laughs> I mean, that's kind of the way that most people have been authoring and creating content. So light rays, you can see kind of how that works here in the equirectangular frame. Let's go into our VR viewer, play this back. And you know, you're really using these transitions as a narrative device. And they're just really beautiful. We've also got some light leaks in here. Even things like the iris wipe, which in a traditional edit, we kind of shy away from. In VR, there's something I don't know, travel channel -y that just kind of works for me with this. You know, that kind of lets you see what it looks like again here in the equirectangular frame. Let's go into the viewer, play it back, and it just works, okay? We've also got full support for headset editing, immersive headset editing. So you'll see, Carl Soleil is going to come up, he'll show you some examples of this where you can have an Oculus Rift or an HTC Vive controlling and inside your headset, you're actually going to be able to see the timeline. And using a laser pointer with your controller with one hand, you can jog and shuttle and move things around, but you can still do keyboard-driven editing with your other hand. So allow you to see and be in context in the sphere as you're editing. And along with all this, this was introduced in April, but it's worth mentioning again, we now have full support for ambisonic audio. So adding immersive audio to your VR 360 video and being able to upload and deploy that to YouTube and Facebook very, very simply. So those are just some of the great new innovations that are coming to this next version of Premiere Pro. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you again next time. And up next, we've got one of our amazing customers who's going to showcase some really cool stuff for you. So stick around for that. Thanks again, and have a good rest of your day, everybody. Thank you.